this is a third lecture in the series on uh, uh, of of my lectures on moving frames and invariance for submanifolds. Uh, this uh, third lecture will be about the general case of submanifolds of property dimensions. I recall that last time we mostly spoke about uh, curves. And uh, I should tell that in advance that this part is uh, uh, the joint is, is largely based on the joint work with uh, uh, Professor Morimoto and Mashida. And I'll give a reference somewhere in the presentation. Just uh, uh, I'll skim through the definitions. This is our standard definitions we have. So we have. Uh, a properly homogeneous space, uh, uh, which is a filtered one. Then we have um, uh, a submanifold uh, of arbitrary dimension. The dimension will be uh, denoted by R later in the presentation. And um, uh, it is, uh, uh, as I said, so it's arbitrary dimension today. Uh, we define a symbol of the submanifold at a point essentially by taking a tangent space to the submanifold and taking a graded space associated with this grade with uh, with this uh, tangent space and uh, well graded spaces at all points uh, of m of the parabolic homogeneous space uh, identify with uh, g minus via well, left shifts for example so I recall that a symbol is uh, uh, not uniquely defined. It's only defined uh, up to an action of G zero. In general, it depends on the point and it is a graded subalgebra in G minus. It's very easy to see. So it's that this is not just a subspace, but a subalgebra. And um, uh, I mentioned a few times already that the key is uh, key uh, assumption throughout the theory is the assumption of the constant symbol. And let's uh, have a closer look. What does this mean for submanifolds? I recall that in case of curves, this was very mild requirement because um, we had only a finite number of possible symbols of curves. And therefore we could assume always that on an opposite subset of a curve, the symbol is constant. Uh, it is no longer the case for uh, submanifolds of higher dimension. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is us. Uh, and uh, let's probably have a look at a few examples and see uh, when and how the symbol may become non constant. Um, so, a very first example I take. Uh, we just take a generic uh, R-dimensional submanifold in the Grassmann variety. Uh, Grassmann variety of k-dimensional subspaces in n-dimensional space. And generically, uh, what we have here, so we, we have to understand, we, what is, first of all, what is G minus in this case? So G minus in the Grassmannian, um, uh, in Grassmann variety, uh, KN, K dimensional subspaces and n dimensional spaces, is identified with K by N minus K matrices. It's uh, one graded, so it's G minus is concentrated at degree minus one. And any subspace will be uh, automatically subalgebra because G minus is abelian. So, uh, and our dimensional submanifold will have a priori just some, uh, as a symbol, will have an R dimensional subspace in matrices of K of, of, of size K and then minus K. And uh, uh, G zero in this case uh, is, uh, well, GLK times GLN minus K quotiented by uh, some center. Uh, center of uh, GLM by identity transformations. Uh, only a, a, a cell part acts non-trivially on tangents, on, on subspaces. Uh, so uh, a reductive part of G0, uh, the center of G0 itself acts trivially on matrices. So we, we may, we, we may uh, just speak about the action of a cell K times a cell N minus K. 
So it's multiplication from the left and multiplication from the right on the matrices. And uh, this is our equivalence. But uh, uh, it is clear for, uh, for dimensional reasons, uh, there are uh, such action uh, of G0 on, on, on subspaces in, in matrices will have uh, orbits and will have continuous parameters. Uh, for example, like the very first example I, I picked up was a three-dimensional submanifolds in Gassman variety of three six, and indeed uh, we would have uh, like an elementary count shows that the tangent space to Gassman variety three six will be nine-dimensional, so will be three by three matrices, uh, and we will be looking for three-dimensional subspaces in the space of three by three matrices, arbitrary subspaces. So it will be of dimension three times uh, uh, six, 18, while the groups acting will be uh, eight plus eight, SL three times SL three, only 16. So we, we may expect, and this is exactly what happens there, a two dimensional uh, 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 space of, uh, uh, parameters, parameterizing uh, generic orbits. There are, there are, of course, some singular orbits, but there will be some generic orbits parameterized by two parameters. And these parameters, parameterizing subspaces, will automatically become functional invariants for a generic submanifold. They will depend on a point. And, and this is what we are actually avoiding in this theory. We are assuming that we do not have functional invariants on the level of a symbol. Uh, well, probably uh, to recall a little bit how uh, the case of submanifolds and projective spaces looks like. This is another example. So let's consider again r dimensional subspaces in projective space. Here on the level of G minus one, we do not have any problems because G minus one is just Rn and all R dimensional subspaces in Rn uh, uh, under the action of GLN, uh, which is G zero in this case, will be of course uh, 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 invariant. But what we are doing next and this lift to the corresponding spaces does work in submanifolds case as well. So we are trying to uh, find the best uh, possible parabolic homogeneous space for our submanifolds. And in this case, uh, we have a natural lift uh, to uh, uh, actually to the first jet space of our dimensional submanifolds in PN. And uh, to be precise, uh, so if you fix an, uh, fix an R dimensional subspace, linear subspace in PN, its symmetry group will be yet another parabolic subgroup. The intersection is another, the intersection of P1, which is a stabilizer of projective space itself, and PR plus one, which is a stabilizer of most symmetric or linear subspace in this case, uh, will again be parabolic. And the space, uh, uh, G by P1, R plus one is nothing but just first jet space. So we can always lift our submanifold to first jet space, which is also a parabolic homogeneous space and look at its symbol there. And last time we were doing this, I think in the first lecture, we recovered a uh, second fundamental form of a hypersurface. But here I assume that the dimension is arbitrary. So actually what happens if you take a lift uh, and of course, this is wrong, so it should be an embedding into a different direction. So it takes n into first jet. And uh, it is clear that local projective geometry of hyper of surfaces of submanifolds of dimension R coincides with local geometry of submanifolds in this first jet space, which are uh, tangent to uh, uh, a contact distribution on this uh, or Cartan distribution on this uh, jet space and transversal to the fibers to, or the projection. And here again, if you look at the symbols, we will arrive at not just a single fundamental form, but N minus R fundamental forms. Well, N minus R 
is a, is a, is a dimension of a normal bundle. So essentially, we, we in projective geometry we speak about a single uh, second fundamental form which takes values in the normal bundle. Um, but uh, I just split it in, into individual components. So we will have n minus r symmetric matrices. Uh, but actually, uh, when we look for a symbol, then only a subspace spent by the symmetric matrices matters. Uh, so our symbol of an R-dimensional submanifold uh, in PN, after we lift it to first jet space, uh, will be uh, described by subspaces of dimension N minus R. Or at least at most n minus r, this matrices might be linearly dependent, but generically this will be exactly n minus r in the space of r by n r matrices. And again, we have orbits here already in the case of three dimensional submanifolds in P6. In this case, we would, uh, to classify symbols or to describe symbols, we would need to describe three dimensional subspaces in the six dimensional space of uh, three by three symmetric matrices. Again, uh, some simple uh, dimension count shows that there are, we, we should expect two parameters here and they will become um, first differential invariants uh, of such submanifolds. But this will be differential invariants on the level of a symbol. And again, this is, again, I repeat that this is what we are avoiding in this theory. So we are assuming that the symbol will be constant. So if you do have, the, well, we do have this differential invariance on the level of a symbol or classifying symbols, um, uh, we, we would need to assume that they're constant. This can actually be compared with, um, uh, classification of uh, symbols of um, filtered manifolds or vector distributions or together with their weak derived series. Uh, in almost all applications we've seen in, in the field, the symbol of such vector distributions seem to be constant, but of course we know that starting from some dimensions, there will be some uh, functional invariance showing up in the symbol. So, Generically, we cannot assume that they're constant. And this is what happens exactly here as well. Uh, so if, if one starts uh, looking for uh, just certain uh, sub-manifolds uh, of generic type, then the very first differential invariance that will be encountered, encountered will be differential invariance of symbols. Uh, well, uh, we, we were speaking a lot about contact G2 geometry, so I thought I will give another example around this. So again, let's look at what we can get as symbols for submanifolds, or not just curves, but submanifolds in contact G2 geometry. Um, so let's start with the dimension two. Suppose we have a two dimensional submanifolds. And suppose they are contact or Legendrian in this case. So they are tangent to the contact distribution. There is a sim then their symbol uh, will be just a two dimensional or well, probably Lagrangian would be more correct for it. Lagrangian subspace in the four dimensional symplectic space G minus one uh, viewed up to the action of GL2. And again, uh, in, this is a simple exercise. If you've never done this before, I do recommend doing this. Just trying to classify all uh, well, Lagrangian subspaces uh, in R4 uh, up to the irreducible action of GL2. That's a nice exercise to prove that there is only a finite number of orbits. So here uh, uh, we, uh, we we can always assume that such submanifolds will have constant symbol. Uh, and however, if you go to a three-dimensional submanifolds. Then their symbol will be already a three-dimensional uh, uh, graded subalgebra. There is no way they could be contact because uh, maximal dimension of contact submanifolds is two in this case. So they uh, they would not be contact. They would inherit or uh, um, its own filtration from the contact manifold. So, and then um, their symbol will be a three-dimensional graded subalgebra. 
in degrees in both sitting in both degrees minus one and minus two, where uh, n minus two is the same as g minus two. So g minus two I recall is one dimensional in this case. Um, uh, so n minus two will be also one dimensional. And now we have for n minus one, we no longer have um, isotropy restrictions. So n minus n minus one can be arbitrary. It can be either uh, uh, can can be arbitrary two dimensional subspace. And now uh, we see again that so due to the dimension counts, there will be some uh, continuous invariance because. Only a cell two inside gel two acts effectively on this Gaussmannian of two dimensional subspaces of four dimensional space and Gaussmannian is four dimensional. So there will be one dimension, one uh, continuous parameter and one differential invariant showing up on the level of a symbol in such cases. Um, so so this is, a, this is what happens uh, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with the assumption of constant symbols. So I repeat again that uh, for uh, submanifolds of higher dimensions, this becomes uh, a restrictive condition to have a constant symbol. Uh, so, but anyway, so from now on, I assume that uh, we have a constant symbol assumption uh, um, uh, uh, holding like on that. And uh, then we have the same notion of prolongation and I told that the prolongation of N, so N is a, our symbol, uh, works independently of the dimension of manifold independently of N. It's just the largest uh, subalgebra of G such that its negative part coincides with N itself. It is constructed, um, it may be constructed inductively similar to Tanaka prolongation, but uh, well, as it is something different. So if you look for subalgebras in G, uh, so we call it intrinsic prolongation. And uh, I recall that uh, this prolongation plays a very important role in understanding that uh, what is the dimension of maximal possible dimension of our, of the symmetry algebra of our manifold, submanifold as well as in understanding what is a flat case. So we do know that uh, there will be uh, uh, flat case. The, the only flat case is where the symmetry algebra will have maximal possible dimension, which is the dimension of the prolongation of n. will be exactly the orbits of um, uh, the Lie subgroup, uh, or Lie subgroup corresponding to this Lie, uh, subalgebra pro n. So that's just a reminder of what we had before and the stays as is. Uh, well, just I introduce a notation which I will use across uh, uh, the talk. So this is um, uh, 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 like uh, non-negative part of the prolongation. So this upper uh, index zero means that uh, we actually start using filtration um, associated with the grading. So we take the sum of all gated subspaces of degree zero and higher. And uh, of course, this is a subalgebra that exactly corresponds to the um, stationary subalgebra of the flat model, of the symmetry algebra of the flat model. Uh, so uh, moving now towards uh, <laughs> normal moving frames. Um, I recall what that what we are looking for. So uh, we would want to construct uh, a moving canonical moving frame, uh, which would be the reduction of uh, the natural principal bundles that sits over our submanifold, which is just pi minus one of uh, of n. So it's a pullback of uh, the tautological principal fiber bundle over our homogeneous space. Um, and uh, we, of course, we have a left invariant marvel cartan form on G, and this is what we will use to uh, normalize our frame. Uh, so the idea of normalize, norm, well, the, the basic idea is that we start um, um, doing iterative process, reducing the bundle Q minus one, which is just pi minus one of N, and we reduce it using some, uh, 
so we, re we reduce, uh, we construct certain, what we call normal moving frame, and I'll, I'll clarify what the word normal means, uh, by imposing some conditions on the, on the image of the Marokartan form on our uh, moving frame bundle. So the, the idea stays the same absolutely as, as before. It's just uh, normalization conditions become much tricky and require a bit more of techniques. And uh, this is what I will introduce now. So again, a basic principle in the theory is that we first set up some algebraic data and then using this algebraic data, we uh, start building uh, a frame. In this case, we would need um, uh, two kinds of uh, complementary subspaces. And in order to be, in order to build, uh, 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 in order to have a very nice result, let's put it like that, we would want to have all objects uh, invariant with respect to this uh, uh, stationary subalgebra pole and zero. Uh, so what we would want to have, first of all, we would want to have a splitting of G itself into our prolongation of the symbol plus an invariant uh, complement. And uh, everywhere by invariant, so I will always mean invariant with respect to the stationary subalgebra inside uh, prolongation of M. It's just for, uh, I, will, I will not pronounce this uh, prolan zero all the time. Uh, so this first assumption seems to be technical. Uh, it might be possible probably to get rid of it, but for simplicity, I just impose this condition. And again, for most practical applications, we do have this condition present. Uh, the second one is the following. So if you consider um, the following object, so it's C1 is, is, is like CKNG by prolongation of N is, is in this case, C1 is one co-chains of the Lie algebra N these values in the uh, in this module. So just to, to see that everything is, is well defined, M is a subalgebra of G uh, or G minus to be precise. So N naturally acts on G. And of course, N is a subalgebra of prolongation of N. So therefore uh, the action of N uh, on G preserves prolongation of N and uh, this quotient G by prolongation of N is well defined. So we would want to consider one co-chains, which is actually just linear maps from N to this quotient space. So I could probably use a notation of home uh, instead of C1, but uh, I start getting uh, uh, the natural uh, cohomology operator. So I, I prefer to use co-chain notation. And then the sign plus below uh, is um, is just uh, the uh, positive degree. So all the spaces are naturally graded. So n is graded, g is graded, prolongation of n is graded. So we have a notion of degree, and therefore, so plus uh, has a perfect sense. So all components here of positive degree, uh, and. Of course, you have co-chain operators that maps C0. C0 in this case is just G by prolongation of N itself. So it's, this operator is quite easy to write down very explicitly. Um, so what we want to have, if we want to have the C1 in positive degree split uh, into uh, the image of uh, D, 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 like uh, D0, D, uh, D0, this is here, sorry, plus uh, something complementary, which should again be invariant. So these two subspaces W1 and W2 will guide us through the construction of the uh, canonical moving frame. And again, uh, a big question on uh, whether such subspaces exist or not. And um, in, in the applications, uh, I will be, uh, uh, presenting today in particular, I will be interested in the case when the prolongation of n is reductive itself. 
So, and if prolongation of n is reductive, then we can prove that such w1 and w2 always exist. Um, and again, just an idea of why why such cases are like important, interesting. A very typical case is exactly um, hypersurfaces in PM. In this case, we were discussing last time that uh, if there's a like hypersurfaces with no degenerate second fundamental form, then after a lift to the first jet, we would recover uh, N to be defined by uh, a signature of the second fundamental form. And then prolongation of N will be exactly uh, the symmetry algebra of uh, the uh, quadratic surface. This quadratic surfaces will be our flat or like, uh, like spheres, if you or, uh, pseudo spheres, if you wish, will be our flat models. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the symmetry of pseudo sphere is uh, so PQ. So this is exactly the case where prolongation of n is reductive. Uh, and uh, well, I'll show many more other examples uh, of this kind. So. Uh, Assuming that prolongation of n is reductive, then we, we, we do have some uniform way of defining this normalization conditions. Uh, so W1 is just a complement of prolongation of n with respect to the killing form of G. Uh, and um, a bit more uh, tricky uh, is to define W2. And here we use the same ideas as uh, uh, in case of normal parabolic geometries. So we would want to define a certain scalar product of G, which is preserved by prolongation of, uh, of stabilizer of prolongation of N, or N zero. Um, using, so to define the scalar product, one needs to go through some algebra of Cartan decomposition of a semi-simple D algebra. But again, this is absolutely the same as in case of uh, parabolic, uh, curved parabolic geometries. And then uh, using this scalar product, uh, we, we can extend the scalar product on all the subspaces like C1, C2, C, well, CK for any K and uh, define a, a co-differential. The co-differential will be dual to the standard Lie algebra cohomology operator. Uh, it will act in a different direction, of course. And uh, now again, using some algebraic harmonic theory, so to say, we can just define W2 as a kernel of uh, delta star. And again, uh, well, to be precise, we have to take only positive part of this uh, kernel. So it's, it will be delta star acting from C1 to C0. And uh, we just take uh, a kernel of delta star intersected with uh, all elements of positive degree. And automatically, again, due to this algebraic harmonic theory, we, we, we can prove that it is complementary. It satisfies this normalization conditions. For a small question, uh, the image of del star uh, is a C i minus one uh, of uh, on n, not g minus. Is that correct? That's probably just a typo. Yes, it's n n. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Denise. Of course, it's n n here. Yeah. All, all all things are. You, you, we, we always fix the same cohomology, the same Lie algebra. Let's see. Let's see print here. Uh, so uh, again, if you compare this with what happens on in 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 parabolic uh, 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 geometries, in curved parabolic uh, uh, geometries, we see that here uh, everything happens in uh, in cochains of one in on the level of one cochains, while in uh, uh, parabolic geometries uh, normalization happens on two cochains. And there is a reason for this. So in in, in this uh, in this in, in this uh, case, the geometry of submanifold things are a bit easier, but very much similar actually. Well, Boris, yeah. Uh, so G is semi-simple, right? Uh, yes. So G is always semi-simple. That's no question about why, this. Why not to take killing form? because prol n0 is just part of G, right? No, we need a scalar product to define. Uh, um, uh, that's very important. So 
to make sure that everything works fine, we really need a positive, uh, positive, 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 really positive definite form, like harmonic theory works only in this case. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 mm -hmm. but you don't assume that prol and zero is uh, reductive. Uh, no, it will it will be consistent with the uh, prol and zero only in case when it is reductive. Other, otherwise, I will not be able to find this invariant scalar okay. product. This okay. is prol and zero will be also reductive. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So this this both items work. Uh, uh, so this stick uh, with harmonic with use of harmonic theory works only if prolongation of n is reductive as well. So it's like uh, both our homogeneous space is a parabolic homogeneous space and the uh, Flat model is also uh, 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 not necessarily parabolic homogeneous space itself, but it will be um, uh, the orbit of a, a, a reductive subgroup. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, so then if you have this two uh, normalization conditions fixed, so if you fix them, then actually we, we do have a unique moving frame. And uh, so how to relate now moving frame with this two subspaces W1 and W2. So what we do uh, to define normalization conditions, we first of all would want to decompose omega into two parts according to the like first normalization condition. So we are looking for certain moving frame. I, I, I haven't yet defined what it is. But whatever moving frame we, we take, we, we can restrict omega to it. And we always can decompose omega into two parts, omega 1 and omega 2, which correspond to the decomposition of G into prolongation of n and w1. So then what we want to have, first of all, we want omega 1 to be a Cartan connection on n itself. Uh, and the Cartan connection with the model of our, uh, uh, modeled by a flat model. <laughs> uh, so it will be, the, the model will be prolongation of fan quotiented by stabilizer of the prolongation of fan. And uh, this Cartan geometry is exactly what we call intrinsic geometry induced on N. So on any submanifold, like for example, on hypersurfaces and projective space, thanks to second fundamental form, we have inherited uh, induced uh, conformal geometry. So even if you start with projective geometry, we on, on, on submanifolds, we, we, um, we find conformal geometry. So the, this is a, a induced intrinsic geometry on the submanifold. So in our case, our induced uh, intrinsic geometry will be exactly Cartan connection, Cartan geometry with this model. So this is one condition we want to have. Uh, and uh, this kind of tells us immediately the size of the moving frame we are looking for. So it, this we are looking for moving frame to be a principal fiber bundle, whose fiber is exactly of the size of prolongation of n zero. And second thing, so we now express omega two, so omega one. Uh, and a linear map psi, uh, so a linear map psi, where it will take values. So omega one will take us into G. Uh, we can uh, prove that uh, only, uh, so along fibers, uh, uh, we, we would want psi to be vanishing along fibers. So it will only be non-trivial on, um, essentially on the negative part of prolongation of n, on n itself. And we want psi uh, to take, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. So yeah, psi to take uh, n into, uh, so it will take n into w1 because omega two itself uh, takes values in, uh, in w1. But here we identify W1 with G by prolongation of N, which we can do because we have, well, we have this direct sum. So as a result, Xi can be viewed as a, as a map from N to W1, which will be one co-chain. And 
we want this psi to belong to our second normalization subspace. So what we are normalizing actually is a, is a linear dependence between omega one and omega two. I will, I will show this in a bit more detail on the next slide to help you to understand what exactly we are normalizing here. Uh, but the statement is here. So uh, assuming we have this normalization conditions, we do have a unique moving frame such that omega one is a Cartan connection. Omega two is expressed via omega one via psi, which belongs to W two. And moreover, we can identify a part of psi, um, which will be a, a part lying in W two intersected with kernel of D itself. So I recall that in, in, in case of prolongation of n to be reductive, psi will we, we can take we can assume that delta star vanishes on psi, but the part of um, uh, W2 intersecting with kernel delta will define a part of psi that will um, what that will actually be a set of fundamental invariants of the embedding. And as before, by uh, fundamental variance, I mean, of course, uh, a set of invariants such that if they vanish, then so our submanifold is flat if and only if uh, this part vanishes. Uh, Boris, a um, question about your condition two. Yep. So then I see composition psi with omega one. Yep. Uh, omega one takes value in pro n, right? Yep. But then you take homomorphism from n to w one. Yep. So I want psi to vanish actually on positive part of prolongation of okay. n. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it will be equivariant and uh, vertical. Ah, great, okay. So uh, what does this mean actually to us? And this is on the next slide. So I am just explaining more detailed normalization conditions. So, uh, so the very first condition says uh, that omega one is a Cartan connection. And this says that essentially the image of omega will always contain the image of omega one. And the image of omega one will be exactly prolongation of n. So we will, uh, we, we would assume that the image of omega includes, uh, contains prolongation of n, and we will consider everything modular prolongation of n. And, and this condition essentially means that we can write down explicitly our image as follows. So we take all x in n and deform them by psi so that they become x plus psi of x for x in n. And we add all uh, non-negative part of the prolongation. So this is exactly the image of omega defined by psi. I think that's kind of more transparent than, than writing this. So this condition is exactly this one. And uh, the conditions we impose uh, will be, uh, so we impose conditions on Xi, like, such as, for example, this one, delta star Xi equal to zero. And this is kind of equivalent to imposing linear normalization conditions on the image of omega. So this is essentially uh, the, the key, key idea of uh, using uh, algebraic uh, guidance to normalize moving frame. So it's uh, it's uh, like deforming our uh, flat case by adding, first of all, by keeping non-negative elements of non-negative degree. So deforming only negative elements of negative degree and deforming via psi, which itself satisfies some linear conditions. So the, um, the, the, this prolongation mod, the, uh, the zero part, I mean, it, it may not be a, an effective pair. Does that matter? At yes, all? yes, uh, uh, no, not at all, not here. Okay. It, will, will, it will be important if you would want to understand what kind of intrinsic geometry we get, because we would, at that moment, we would want to quotient out the, the kernel of uh, non-effectiveness. And but in the prolongation theory, it's it's very important. It stays as is completely. Oh, sorry, in prolongation, in normalization, in normalization of the moving frame. Okay. We can cannot get go, rid of it. Can you just go back one slide, please? Yep. 
In your third condition there. Uh, yeah, that's a misprint, sorry. <laughs> I think that would be, again, G divided by prolongation of N. And the it's H1 plus of N, is that right? Of N, yes. So that should be, yes, sorry. I'm very sorry for this. Mm -hmm. I think I corrected it everywhere, but I was I was changing the notation on the way, so okay, cool. it should be H1 plus N with values in G by prolongation of N. It's always the same uh, uh, cohomology. So, 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 you, so you, you get invariant derivations from one and you get an differential invariants from three, right? Uh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes, that's very precise the statement. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And ideas of the proof. So, this is a reference to the paper uh, that was published uh, at the beginning of this year in Sigma Journal and was available in archives since 19, 2019. Uh, and the idea stays the same as in case of curves. So we do uh, we do a series of uh, uh, we build a series of uh, reductions. So at each step we reduce one principal bundle to a principal sub bundle, and the which each time we reduce uh, the structure group to a smaller subgroup, which is which descends to the uh, prolongation of n zero stabilizer of prolongation of n. So at each step we arrive at um, at the uh, prolongation of n zero plus everything uh, starting from the k plus one. This is naturally subalgebra. And the idea is uh, the, of normalizing is, uh, well, I, I put it briefly like this, but of course it requires a bit more technical details to clarify this condition. And uh, I reference this paper. I don't want to spend a lot of time on technicalities here, but the idea is that we always, on each step, we do this kind of decomposition and we would want to make sure that our Xi belongs to W2 modular elements of degree K plus one and higher. So on each step, we uh, exactly normal, on K step, we exactly normalize uh, part of Xi in degree K so that it starts to belong to W2 in degree K. And of course, as we, well, uh, if you are in the finite dimensional case, it, it all um, works nicely. So it descends uh, after a finite number of steps, it descends to what we want. Uh, so I summarized uh, basic ideas uh, in this nice table, like interplay between algebra and geometry. Uh, so uh, on the left, we have a purely linear, well, Lie algebra stuff, uh, which works as a guidance for the geometric uh, uh, properties of submanifolds. And in particular, of, uh, I, even if it's not worked out in, in detail, I think I, I think uh, this algebraic guidance uh, can be used to calculate uh, well, like uh, Hilbert polynomials for differential algebra of invariants uh, uh, for any submanifold with a given symbol for the class of submanifolds with a given symbol, to be precise. Uh, so computing how many invariants at which degree, uh, at which order do we get in jet spaces. Um, well, so on the left, we have essentially a symbol, a prolongation of the symbol. Uh, so a symbol is, is a graded tangent space to a submanifold. Uh, prolongation of a symbol is our flat model on the geometric meaning normalization conditions is what we need to construct a moving frame. And uh, cohomology, and now I put it correctly, <laughs> finally, uh, gives us fundamental invariance of submanifolds. Uh, and uh, I don't have much time for applications. Uh, probably, um, well, there are many applications here, like uh, 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 if one would want to look at, for example, uh, uh, differential geometry of uh, uh, hypersurfaces in PN, projective differential geometry of hypersurfaces. There is an excellent paper by, or a book actually, or a series of works by Sasaki and collaborators who, who go along this line. There are also very nice works of um, 
Goldberg, uh, a book of Goldberg and Akivis, who also in large use the same kind of ideas, but uh, uh, in a much more explicit way, I'd say. Um, so one interesting application I'd like to mention here is uh, deformation theory of rational homogeneous varieties, just because that uh, it was one of the motivations, uh, primary motivations to develop the, the whole theory. And second, because we have a very nice correspondence between the results and um, uh, well, between the, the between the, the language uh, of rational homogeneous varieties and the language you've just developed. So I recall what it is. So I would want to take. So I, I would want to take any um, uh, parabolic homogeneous space as a model now. So before we were considering. Uh, parabolic homogeneous spaces as ambient spaces where we were looking for submanifolds. Now, as an ambient space, I will take a Grassmann variety or flag variety in general. And inside this Grassmann variety, I will define the embedding of uh, a different parabolic homogeneous space. So it works like that. So I take, so, I, and, uh, for simplicity, I switch to complex from real to complex here, but of course the same theory works for real, uh, just requires a bit more care. So let S be a complex semi-simple Lie group and uh, V just a arbitrary irreducible representation. Uh, so S is a Lie algebra of capital S, we fix a parabolic S zero and the corresponding grading uh, of S, we have a grading element so this grading element defines us a, a compatible grading on the representation itself. So I start with uh, any representation of S and uh, define uniquely grading on V. Then um, this grading defines us a, a filtration or just standard flag. And we act on by S on this flag and this gives us uh, uh, an embedding from S by S zero into a flag variety. Where alpha is some indices of dimensions of, uh, of the subspaces we get in V uh, via this compatible grading. You can think about this also as a, a unique closed orbit uh, of S acting irreducibly on PN. P of V, this is one of the examples, for example. So you can, you can, so what I, the definition I gave is a bit more general. It assumes that uh, one can get um, more than just, uh, well, we of course have a lowest vector or a highest vector of this representation, but we might have many more vectors which are non, not highest or not lowest, but having the same degree as highest and lowest vectors. So we, uh, um, but assuming that we just take a closed orbit of highest vector, this will uh, also define us a geometry of this kind. So such embeddings are known as rational homogeneous varieties. Spheres, for example, is one of them. A joint uh, varieties, um, uh, like uh, highest root orbits of any sim of a joint representation for any semi-simple Lie algebra is another example. But I, I think most of the classical like Blücher embeddings, uh, Segre embeddings, uh, uh, what else? They are all of this kind. Uh, so we can easily see that uh, actually from definitions read that this submanifold is flat, flat in terms of um, uh, our definitions. So it will have a symbol which is exactly the negative part of S. And uh, this will be a flat model among all submanifolds having the same symbol in this big ambient parabolic homogeneous space. Well, flag varieties, of course, a big ambient parabolic homogeneous space. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's not difficult to prove that prolongation of S minus is S itself. He always, it's, you can compare this with uh, Yamaguchi theorem, but much in a much easier way. Um, 
So next is that uh, we, we would want to understand, we, we know that fundamental and that we have the theory of uh, canonical, we can build a canonical moving frame and we will arrive at fundamental invariance sitting in this uh, cohomology space. And uh, uh, what is nice is that this computation of this cohomology space can be done via constant theorem. I recall that we can always use constant theorem where the representation uh, uh, of S minus is the restriction of uh, the representation of S. But of course, SLV by S uh, is, uh, has a natural action of S. So it, it's just a restriction of this action to S minus we need to consider. So we, we say that the ratio of homogeneous variety is rigid if this cohomology is trivial. So in particular, we know if this cohomology is trivial, then all fundamental invariants are automatically vanishing. And then, um, uh, uh, well, this is equivalent, yeah. Any submanifold in this flag variety with the same symbol as S by zero is locally equivalent uh, to S by zero itself. So there is no way to deform uh, S by zero preserving the symbol. This is what it says. So uh, uh, this examples uh, for one graded case appeared, I think, uh, in, in works of Huangi Yamaguchi, and uh, then uh, for two graded contact case and then higher generalizations, uh, they, were, they, they, they appeared in works of uh, Landsberg and Robles. And um, uh, what we prove uh, applying constant theorem essentially is that the only possible non-rigid rational homogeneous varieties are these ones, PL, so projective spaces, QL, uh, uh, complex uh, quadrix in this case, F1, L, L plus one. So this is a flag variety of dimension uh, of subspaces dimension one and L in L plus one dimensional space. So this is essentially the adjoint um, variety of SL L plus one. Uh, or if L is S is not simple, those having this variety is, is the direct product decomposition. So of course, if you have S by zero probably homogeneous space and this is semi-simple, not simple, we have a direct product decomposition. Uh, so very few actually uh, <laughs> rational homogeneous varieties are non-rigid. Uh, we have to, yeah, I have to emphasize here that uh, the theorem specifies only the type of S by zero, it doesn't specify V. And depending on the presentation of V, we might have different embeddings of these varieties. So like PL can be embedded in multiple ways into other P, uh, PN, for example. Re-embedded several times as well, as well. And this is the same for QL and uh, this variety. Uh, so ideas of the pros. So how does constant theory work here and uh, what actually happens? But, 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 yeah. A question about previous statement. Yeah, true. Uh, so, um, so the rigidity depends on embedding, right? Yes. So the non, uh, non rigid are P, but probably depending on V, they can become actually rigid. Yes, exactly. This will be exactly mentioned on the next slide. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so ideas of the proofs, and uh, so let's for simplicity take a complex simple graded Lie algebra. So let it be, uh, so we, we have to, what we have to do, we have to, well, to compute this, we have to decompose SLV by S into all possible irreducible representations of S, and then compute using, compute, uh, you apply constant theorem to each of these irreducible pieces sitting here. So this is exactly what we do. We take any irreducible submodule over S module SLV. We don't even quotient by S, just take any irreducible module. Um, and uh, we apply constant theorem. So it applies it's just first cohomology. So it's, it's fairly easy computation. Uh, and uh, we prove that this thing vanishes so it's essentially, it's just computing the degree in which this cohomology sits. We know that for each irreducible submodules, there will be exactly one, uh, uh, one uh, irreducible uh, uh, submodule 
uh, in the cohomology. So we just need to compute the degree of the submodule. And, um, and we prove that essentially R is uh, negative or zero unless in the following cases. And these are all cases, uh, yeah. So this is again, uh, well, it's an exercise and root systems and, and the reflections. And again, all the details are given in our paper. And I think even earlier, this kind of similar computations were done by uh, Landsberg and Rabelais. Uh, so these are all cases. And uh, by looking at them, we, so they seem to be more than what I listed uh, uh, before. So before I had only PL, QL, and F1L. Uh, but if you look at the detail, you see that, for example, A3 uh, with alpha 2, like uh, cos on the second uh, uh, node of the thinking diagram would be the same. Like if you identify A3 with D3, this will be a particular case of a, coni uh, of a, a quadratic surface of Q, Q something, I don't remember, Q, Q4 probably. Then here, of course, uh, we have a symmetry that swaps uh, one and L. So this would be all both projective spaces. And this will be exactly the uh, alpha one, alpha L. Sub, um, uh, so two crosses on the sides would exactly correspond to the joint representation. And then B cases, uh, 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 under a prop B, B cases will, would lead you to, to quadrix or with some isomorphism to some other subspaces here. And finally, it all stabilizes. Yes, and for C cases, yeah, I have to be careful here. So uh, for C cases, uh, again, in alpha one, and this is the same as B2 alpha two, this is again projective space, but under constricted under the different uh, uh, action, uh, consider it, uh, um, with a different uh, group S. So both PGL L plus one and the uh, symplectic group would act transitively on PL. So both ca in both cases, we might get uh, uh, interesting uh, non-rigid cases. So this is what I, what I um, uh, clarify here. And this is exactly, Boris, what you meant. So that even in these cases, we know the S by zero, we don't know uh, the representation. And depending on the presentation, uh, it might be rigid or non-rigid. And so far, uh, the complete classification of representations is unknown. This is an open question, whether these are really rigid or non-rigid. And even if the cohomology is non-zero, we don't know if it realizes. We don't know if the deformations do exist. In those cases, we uh, for for each of these subspaces, we know at least one representation where it's non-rigid. But uh, that's uh, still a large uh, space for investigation. Uh, I just have one more example of this theory, and this example is like a bit provocative, uh, but I'll give it here. So it's. Uh, the same theory uh, can be actually applied when we have uh, uh, infinite dimensional transitive leap shifter groups. Of course, we don't speak then about um, uh, probably homogeneous spaces, and the theory becomes a bit more complicated. We don't have killing form and the scale of product, but we would still be sometimes able to find normalization conditions uh, W1 and W2 and would still be able to define what is a moving frame, but then we would need to do a projective limit. So our normalization procedure would no longer be finite, it will be infinite, but would still be well-defined uh, uh, by going to projective limits. And as an example, I, 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 I look at, uh, at uh, the geometry of second order release, our favorite example. Uh, but now uh, uh, treating uh, this uh, uh, second order ODE is just a sub manifold in G2. And G2, G2 for maps from R to R. 
So what happens here, so G will be infinite dimensional uh, uh, pseudo group of point transformations acting on G2. So lifted to G2 and N will be just a submanifold uh, of co-dimension one and the transversal to the projection from G2 to G1. So how the theory would work here? And again, I reference uh, the paper with uh, Marimoto and Mashida on the details, but uh, we, so this G2 has a very natural filtration defined by, um, in this case, so G2 will be four dimensional. It will be like Gursa type distributions that defines the filtration on G2. So it's um, G minus in this case will be four dimensional nilpotently algebra, which is a symbol of the uh, Gursa distribution or contact distribution in G2. So this, uh, uh, this is uh, the notation. So it's spent by X and then three, uh, Y1, Y2, Y3 with these brackets and these degrees. And uh, we can still define what is a, a symbol of N. And it turns out that these conditions that uh, in the three dimensional and transversal to the fibers of the projection forces us um, uh, or implies that N has a constant symbol, symbol given by X and Y2 and Y3. So X and Y1 here span a Gaussian type distribution, a contact distribution. Uh, of course, N cannot be, um, it cannot contain, cannot contain a contact distribution, cannot be tangent to, to con well, contact distribution cannot be tangent to, to N to be precise, then there's not much uh, freedom left. And uh, we can prove that G minus in this case is, uh, uh, well, it will be N again, G minus is four dimensional. So the symbol will be N, it will be three dimensional subalgebra. Spent by X, Y2 and Y3. And, uh, and then we can do extrinsic prolongation. Uh, and uh, well, not surprisingly, so extrinsic prolongation tells us what is the maximal possible symmetry in this case. So it will give us exactly a cell three, it will recover the symmetry of uh, uh, the trivial equation. And then we can play some tricks to try to compute this cohomology because this is where our fundamental invariance lie. And uh, so N would still act on G, which is infinite dimensional the algebra, but well, we may still define uh, cohomology, quotient with by cell three. And it turns out that there is a, a nice uh, short exact sequence. Well, actually this will be just a cell three embedded into G and then projected to G by a cell three. And then we, if you look at the long, um, exact sequence generated by this short one, we'll, 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 we'll see that this H1 um, uh, is naturally isomorphic to H2 of N with values in the cell 3R. And this H2 is exactly what is um, uh, normally, uh, uh, what we normally see in uh, the path geometry associated uh, with uh, second order release. So our approach where fundamental invariants sit in first cohomology does nicely correspond to the classical uh, Tanaka or Cartan approach to the geometry of second order release where the invariants would sit in a different cohomology space, but this cohomology space is unnaturally isomorphic. So I mentioned here degrees change a little bit. So again, this is uh, just a pioneer example showing that there might be some hope to relate uh, extrinsic geometry of uh, submanifolds viewed up to infinite dimensional groups of transformations with classical uh, Tanaka geometry. Uh, but that's certainly uh, now developed only on the level of basic definitions and uh, well, basic constructions and examples. And that's it. This is the last slide of my series of lectures. So thank you very much. And uh, well, I'm looking forward to your questions. 
Uh, are there any questions? Maybe I'll ask a question about the, the no. grade part. I'm not, uh, not sure if I quite got it. So, I mean, in, in the classical um, approach, you get you get a by grading three comma one, right? Or one comma three for the two components of H2. Yep. Or the homogeneity four. So, so what, in the H1 setting, what, do you remember what the gradings are there, I guess? Uh, mm, sorry, no, unfortunately. But G, G there is infinite dimensional. This is the G is infinite dimensional. G is uh, so it's a graded Lie algebra uh, associated with uh, um, uh, uh, pseudo Lie algebra of all vector fields essentially on uh, on on the on the plane. So, but this so, is an isomorphism in the, uh, in what sense, I guess? Pardon? The, this is an isomorphism like between H one and H two. It's an isomorphism in what sense? Oh. Uh, Classical isomorphism uh, between uh, vector spaces. Yeah. Like uh, this is what you get when you go from a short exact sequence of modules into long exact sequence of cohomology. Yeah. So cohomology of n with values in G vanish, right? That's yes, exactly. Uh, actually, any or only first and second? Uh, I have to, I think only first of second, and so for, for first and second, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe so, yeah, okay, yeah. Are there any other questions, reports? Uh, perhaps I have a, a comment, uh, uh, maybe stroke question. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I, I've encountered these, uh, these manifolds in, um, in his parabolic geometries, I mean, in his homogeneous parabolic geometries, mm -hmm. and uh, also these, uh, this, this connection with the, the irreducible representations that you mentioned in your, mm -hmm. in your penultimate slide. And it was in the, in the context of a, of a theorem that arose in general relativity, which is known as the Kerr theorem. And uh, so they're, they're very special submanifolds in the sense that they're, they're, they satisfy some generic I mean, you have to have the double vibration. So it's in the mm -hmm. context of this double vibration. And, uh, so, and you, you mentioned already the correspondence space, but there is also this other space, yep. uh, the, the, the twister space. So mm -hmm. actually these submanifolds uh, are present in the twister space mm -hmm. of the uh, primary space. And these submanifolds arose from uh, foliations in the, in the, primary, mm -hmm. the primary space. Uh, as least you can you can think of them as um, as the leaf spaces of the mm -hmm. of the uh, foliations and prior space. And uh, uh, I think I, I I came to you a few years ago and you you gave me some uh, very good advice on how to deal with this. And uh, it seems that they they yeah so they they restrict the um, uh, the um, oh, um, how do you call it. Uh, Sorry, I, I've got to, my mind went blank. The, uh, oh, the symbol, sorry. Yep. <laughs> it, it restricts the, the symbol of these, uh, of these uh, mm -hmm. varieties. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I'm wondering, um, uh, I mean, these, these cases could be the very nice, uh, very nice examples to look at. Mm -hmm. So the examples I have are, arose from irreducible representations. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can you can uh, you can uh, think of the foliations on the primary space as as coming from a first BGG operator mm -hmm. as well. So it's uh, yeah. So there is a nice story here. Yeah, there is a, certainly some some. There should be some relations around uh, with BGG theory and uh, uh, certainly, but uh, because there is also a hidden part of this theory which I didn't bring into these lectures. Um, uh, so all the submanifolds, uh, like in case of Velchinsky theory that uh, 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 builds the correspondence between curves and projective spaces uh, with uh, linear uh, ordinary differential equations. Um, this correspondence uh, works all the time whenever our big ambient parabolic homogeneous space is actually flag variety. 
then you can um, embed it into a flag variety. That's also a possibility. Then um, one can uh, uh, make a correspondence between uh, submanifolds uh, with a given symbol and finite type systems of PDEs with also a fixed symbol. But then fixed symbol 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 would be just a classical definition of a symbol of uh, linear PDEs, uh, but well weighted uh, in, in in weighted sense. Uh, so, and when we speak about finite type PDEs, there there seem to be some linear operators behind the story, and then probably BGGs as well. It, it yeah, actually, a, a very simple example is uh, if you con consider a projective line mm -hmm. in your twister space. Uh, in uh, well, on the, you take your twister space to be a projective space for simplicity. Mm -hmm. Then you can show that it uh, it corresponds to the leaf space of a of a of a of a killing uh, one form, mm -hmm. uh, which is a projectively invariant uh, differential equations, and which is. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are, which arises uh, as the the kernel of the first BGG operator, mm -hmm. and another one is is if you take a hyperplane um, in a projective space, then you can show the that uh, it, mm -hmm. it yeah so that's the dual and it corresponds to a, a not Euler type a differential mm -hmm. equation which is projectively invariant. So mm -hmm. there there are these nice correspondences to to look yeah. at. Yeah, I should probably get back to these discussions, which I probably yeah. dropped some time ago. Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. So I finished the paper, actually. Uh, <laughs> Are there any other questions for Boris? If not, let's thank Boris for a fantastic series. Thank, thank you, Mark.